Um, you will drive the presentation, right? Um, yes, I will. I will. Uh, I will drive the presentation and uh, make sure that everyone knows who turn it is. So do we have everyone? Where is Alex? Yeah, exactly. Where is Alex? He's up here. Don't don't uh, don't hurt your neck, Tim. He's having uh, sound issues, so maybe he's trying to mm. connect and reconnect. Okay. So we have. Are we supposed to? We're supposed to get going already, isn't it? Can we wait a couple more minutes? Oh. Oh, and audio is out. Great. Um, for the moment, Alex is not in the world, but maybe uh, it's uh, just join us. Joining us. Um, Alex is arriving. Hello, Alex, are you with us? I think so. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes, wonderful. Sir. Sorry about that. Nice tie. Thanks. Great, lovely. I think we we are all here. So let's let's um, let's start. Um, so we we are well. Thank you everyone to uh, to join us for this uh, exciting conversation. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna quickly present uh, or, or what we do briefly, very briefly, to to give you a bit of context. Um, and then, and then we will uh, we'll go through some uh, questions about dual architecture, and, and this is all about. Um, I'm just curious to know: is 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 everyone can 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 everyone cheers and say hello and give us some feeling of audience? Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, great. Hello. 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 And yes, there we go. So move on. And and by by curiosity, who who? Is there any architects in the in the room? Is there any UX designer in the room? Who who can you can you can you uh, make a move if you are architect? Hmm. Nothing. Nobody moving. There we go. One over there. Oh yes. And and any one working as UX designer or, or graphic designer? Some of you. Okay. Nice. Great. Okay. So, um, the the five uh, five five of us. Uh, I'm just going to go through quickly. So we have Alex Coulomb. Uh, then we have Andrea Ion Ponsokoru, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, Owen, Kim Bowman Larsen, and myself Pierre Francois Gérard. Um, and I think the idea is that we First, oh, there we go. Can't press the next slide. That's already a good start. Um, so, what did we say? Yes, actually, um, I was offering Alex the, uh, the the honor of of giving an intro. Um, if you want to 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 give that a go, Alex, maybe that would be uh, great. Sure. Uh, uh, should we do the intro to ourselves first, or an intro to the whole talk? Yes. No. Give, give, a, give maybe give an intro to yourself, and then, and then briefly uh, give the stand. Um, I think that the, I did give a, a change to the to the to the intro before, but I think it would be good if you give a bit of an intro to you, to, uh, to you, and then, and then the the, the general idea of what we were going to discuss, and then we're going to go to uh, Andrea. And Owen and uh, Kim and then myself and I will finish with some uh, some some uh, cues on, on to, to lead uh, further the discussion if that's all right. Okay. And uh, am I going to be controlling the slides or are you controlling them? I can I can go to the slide if you if you want. So you can. Yeah. Go ahead. Right 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll come back to this one after, but there you go. Okay, sure. Hi everyone, uh, it's me, Alex Coulomb of Agile and Immersive Design. Um, I'm an XR designer based in New York City. I like to say architect turned ex-architect uh, because I'm primarily involved in creating virtual spaces now. Um, and by the way, this is an, an older picture of me. You can go to the next slide. There we go. That's much more accurate now. This looks more like me post-pandemic. And uh, I've been involved with mostly creating theaters over the past 10 years. Next slide. Um, so I started using the Oculus Rift development kit back in 2013 and uh, would basically take all the different ways that we were designing theaters around the world and try to represent that in VR. Next slide. And then very quickly, um, you can just kind of scroll through these, started to get excited, not just about representing the final version of architecture in VR, but really using it throughout the design process. So using programs like Tilt Brush, for example, to uh, do the equivalent of like VR napkin sketches. How do you give the sense of, of what a space could potentially become uh, without you know, being too explicit about what material it's gonna be or where exactly the light's coming from? And I've really enjoyed um, that kind of process. And then there's projects like this, uh, the Brockman Hall for Opera, which was the first architecture project that I was able to do entirely from um, womb to tomb, or tomb, I guess, to construction, conception to completion, let's say that. <laughs> I hope it's not uh, going to be destroyed anytime soon. Um, that we use VR at every stage of the design process from the very beginning to now. And because we have this wonderful, very photorealistic version of the project now in Unreal Engine and several VR platforms, um, including the Vive Focus 3, I gave a little talk at VibeCon about that. Um, it's exciting now to have this really perfect digital twin of this space and, and more on the way and starting to speculate on what role real architecture can play in the metaverse. How, what, what's it mean to take a space that was designed with the same uh, architectural psychology and functional ideas of how it would work in the real world and how do you then begin to use that in the virtual world? That's one of the topics I'd be interested in discussing today. Um, I can't remember if there's the next slide or not. Go right ahead. Yeah, and then uh, just to start to position some of the conversations I'm interested in us having today as we discuss virtual architecture, you know, there's all these different doctrines and mantras and books and uh, manifestos about what architecture should be and what you can and can't do with architecture. And when you look at some of the star architects through time and some of the, the quotables that they have about, um, you know, for example, what you can and can't do with architecture, you'll notice that in the case of pretty much all of the quotes I've listed here, um, this kind of falls away with virtual architecture. So, you know, I mentioned I design a lot of theaters. Uh, Rem Kulaus talks about the problem of the best theater being a shoebox uh, in terms of its shape. But of course, in virtual architecture, we can make the acoustics anything we want. It doesn't need to be a shoebox. Um, Renzo Piano talks about how we are always fighting against the idea of gravity. Uh, we don't have gravity in virtual reality, so that's not necessarily a constraint. And then Louis Kahn has his favorite quote about asking the brick what it wants to be. And so, you know, what's a virtual brick want to be? What, it, what does a pixel want to be? There start to be these other questions of materiality in other spaces. So um, that's me. And uh, just to set up a little bit of, of kind of the, the tone of what we want to talk about today, I think we want to get into some debates. I think we'd love to have um, you all participate as well. I think we'd like to discuss things like the architecture of, say, the room that we're in right now and what this is and is not doing for us. And um, yeah, I think that's enough of a teaser. I, I, think, it, I think it's going to be an exciting discussion. And I'll now hand it off to Andrea. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry to be facing the wrong way. I'm trying to see the slides. Yeah, I'm coming with the right side. You, you can yeah, click no on problem. screens. You can click on screen soon while you're talking screen. facing the right. At the bottom, yes. The oh, bottom. nice. Um, yes. That's handy. Great. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm um, Andrea Jan Kozokaru. I um, I have a company in Germany that is trying to do um, something a little bit crazy. We are trying to design and develop both real spaces and real buildings, and, and by real I mean physical and virtual spaces. Um, and this is an example of a project that we are about to complete for a virtual reality platform for collaboration called Arthur. And um, we are basically trying to answer the question, 
what is the difference between physical space and virtual space and how does that change workflows how does that change the kind of spaces that we design how we design them how people interact inside and the more we are active in this space uh, the more we are discovering that these are just huge monumental questions because you know as, as you probably know um, architecture is such a multidisciplinary field there are no single answers to anything um, it's never just about walls and just about windows. It's always also about the body in space and what's the human body and how do people interact with each other or what kind of activities happen in that space. Um, so that's as much architecture as the actual construction materials. And the moment you go down that rabbit hole in trying to draw parallels or trying to differentiate physical architecture from virtual architecture, um, you realize that things are starting to get extremely interesting and extremely complex really fast. So what are virtual materials? What is a virtual brick like Alex mentioned? Is it a pixel? Um, what kind of shapes would that go into? What, what, what are bodies? What are bodies in virtual reality? Um, how do we create spaces that can account for a variety of different kind of virtual bodies. And um, as, as, as an overarching theme to the kind of work that we do is also this just a, a cultural interest in trying to figure out what does it mean that now all of a sudden we have this space that's generated by technology that we can go inside of so for me that in itself it's still a mind-blowing proposition that all of a sudden i can go inside a piece of technology and experience something in there with my body um, and there is of course the feeling that we have stumbled upon something quite extraordinary that's going to have long-term repercussions about how we are defining architecture and how we're redefining spatial design. Great, thank you, Andrea. Perfect. Um, I think, uh, Kim, if you want to briefly go to your work. Kim, don't, yes. don't, don't, don't hurt your neck though. <laughs> oh, no, uh, I think I, I'm facing, I don't know if I'm facing the right way, I'm looking at the screen, but um, yeah, um, my, my name is Kim, um, I would like to thank you, Pierre-Francois, for, uh, uh, well, virtual for, the, um, I'm a Norwegian architect, and I uh, will briefly talk to you a little bit about my journey getting to virtual architecture. It started in the mid-90s when I my, I wrote my master thesis at the University of Houston. I um, idea that I could use uh, create a visual uh, grammar thesis for a 3D World Wide Web it led me to starting uh, joining a VR startup, but clearly realized that it wasn't really commercially viable. So I went home and did images like this for um, I had I, I put up two startups both in Arcviz and. Um, most of the work we did for other architects, but this was uh, a previous one, and this one was my own designs. And I quickly realized that you know, my true passion led in finding these virtual spaces, but also in, in tools to make them. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, I've also dappled in uh, VFX film, uh, TV, um, and I um, guess, uh, I rediscovered immersive VR in 2012, like so many others, and then I basically decided to quit ArcVis and go full in for 100% VR. And this is an example of some of my more uh, art-related projects uh, for a volumetric demo for a Kung Fu experience. Um, and um, I do few storytelling in work, which I learned from many of environmental psychology. 
the one of the things that I like a lot is the uh, the theory of refuge. Do we have a? a can we hear everyone, Kim? I feel it's sound is cutting. Sound is cutting off. Oh, that's uh, that's bad. Um, Anyway, so this was a, a project for Dimension 10. It was recently acquired by Vario, and um, it's like a virtual meeting space for AEC industry. And uh, while it leans on skeuomorphism, there is no furniture in here. Last slide. So while most of us do not have to fear wildlife hunting us on a daily basis the reptile part of our brain feels it's much more comfortable to sit with our back against the wall and while we do not need feelings to keep their out in vr creating similar features like this um, allowing people to me feel more comfortable is something that uh, i am a I've lost you, Kim. Yep, I'm finished. Oh, okay. Well, great. Thank you, Kim, for this brief presentation. And uh, maybe, Owen, if you want to briefly go to your um, your work, which is to give us the change, uh, is not from architecture, but uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, explain your, your uh, process, Owen. Yeah, yeah. I change the slide as well. Okay. Hopefully, your sound will be all right, Owen. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Um, it, yeah, it works. Okay, it might, it might be, I'm kind of getting notices oh. here, so it's dropping in and out maybe, but hopefully it'll be solid. Um, so basically, uh, if you want to go to the first slide there, my background is in art. Uh, I'm a painter predominantly, um, and, and uh, COVID hit. Uh, this is the type of work that I would have done. Uh, or, or abandoned places. Um, this year, uh, I entered the NFT space and discovered virtual reality. Uh, so, very, very so basically, daily my mind is blown with what's possible. Um, so, what I'm trying to do is to replicate the NFTs on the left, virtual spaces on the right. Uh, what I'm trying to do is replicate the exact uh, location in a walk around space. And um, well, one of the questions that I, I've been thinking after I was asked to, to join this, uh, if virtual space is able to, to be as emotive as an artwork. Um, so I think essentially what I'm trying to do is to create a walk around art. Uh, and through doing that, those architecture comes into it because I've built up a few galleries to display these pieces. And, uh, constantly questioning, you know, should I put light switches on the wall and the fact that there's lights on the roof, kind of, they're all pointless, but they bring cues to the real world. Uh, it's interesting that our mind maybe needs that to ground ourselves. Yeah, that's my background. And Pierre just asked me to possibly have a, a different outlook on honor. Yes, thank you, Owen. I hope I hope people could were able to understand the most of what Owen is saying. Hopefully, uh, that worked. Your internet connection. I'm just reading the message there. Oh, maybe you can try that when, um, yeah. in the meantime, I'll I'll, go, yeah. yeah, in the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll present briefly myself. 
Um, I'm not going to go much into uh, where I'm coming from because actually it's pretty similar to Kim. Uh, <laughs> I've learned architecture at school and uh, and and went for uh, work as a 3D visualizer. Um, but um, I'm now um, uh, I'm now actually uh, a co-founder on a, of, a, of a Metaxu Studio, which is a design practice where we are dedicated to design virtual environment that can inspire a sense of awe, but also offer the functionalities needed by our clients. Um, and uh, I'm so passionate about applying architecture skills into the metaverse that I even completed a PhD uh, working out a, a framework uh, that we could use maybe to design meaningful virtual environments. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take you to or, or main uh, use case that we are working on for the last um, five months. Um, so we decided uh, in, in, uh, in February, in January, February, we decided to use a social media platform, Mozilla Hubs, to run a monthly event called in real time. And the main purpose uh, was to rapidly prototype a spatial layout and testing it live with real people uh, well, with real people behind the avatar and, and, and have their feedback and, and see what was working and, and what's not working. Uh, and this first iteration was uh, really good fun. And actually, uh, Kim here was able to, to share one of his uh, projects. Um, he was working on an immersive virtual theater. Uh, and yeah, for each event, we have around 20, between 15 and 20 participants. So we, we did. Uh, run through a lot of, of feedback and what I'm particularly asking you to, to do is pay attention to to the evolution of the space uh, itself and uh, the, the way uh, the way we've designed the, the space so in, in this second iteration um, we, we decided to collaborate with uh, another startup uh, curati which were which is a it brings curated art into office and home obviously during the lockdown uh, it was more difficult so we decided to see if we could uh, do an exhibition in, in this gallery obviously this is all very 2d oriented so we, we were feeling a little bit frustrated just by using such a, a spa special uh, space to, to show 2d so for the, the following iteration we decide to, to 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 take all this into account and we, we really changed the space uh, we, we went for a bit of a smaller space you can see actually the, the it's a bit silly uh, to look at it from the exterior but that's some, somewhere we never really uh, are it's always from the interior and so um that's where we actually started to collaborate with Owen here so you can see part of his sculpture uh in in the in each space uh, and and so we we really designed the space more to host uh, 3d models um and and then we we went for the uh, fourth iteration where again we um, really tried to improve even more the space taking also account of the feedback so we actually create a second floor downstairs and then we say okay how do we how do we um guide and how do we how do we make sure because it, it's all about the journey that each participant um is invited to follow and so we, we um, create these ribbons, uh, which are multifunctional in a way. They, they, they are used uh, as rails uh, to, to obviously stop falling. And then they, they also guide people into the different uh, arms. Uh, and, and they also uh, lift up, uh, as you can see uh, some, in some area in the corner, uh, to become an arch to invite people to go uh, downstairs um, and, and so maybe that's that's where I, I want to bring this conversation I mean this is one example of, of uh, I don't know if we can call that geomorphism but, but that's really where we want to lead this this conversation um, and I have a, another slide to, to uh, bring this into more uh, concrete idea but yeah so the, the first question I want to discuss with with, uh, and have everyone uh, ideas on this is is really uh, is geomorphism uh, a way to to to, uh, to to 
design virtual uh, architecture um, and, and, uh, and, and what's your approach uh, to, to this uh, and yeah, I'll put a, a brief definition of slow morphism here to make sure that everybody knows what we what we are talking about. So the the, the really good uh, old uh, example is the, the bin uh, on everyone everyone's laptop. But actually, can we use our element uh, architecture elements uh, in the same way to create those virtual environments, or or is there is there no meaning there? I mean, who want to uh, who want to address this uh, uh, this question? Who wants to start here? Well, I would first like to say that when you define schoomorphism like this, then I guess you first have to say that um, virtual architectural spaces are a way of an interface. Um, don't you think that, uh, Andrea? Yeah, Andrea? Or uh, you maybe. I, I apologize, I was muted. Um, right. I was saying, Kim, could you tell us more about how you're defining interface in this context? Well, um, as a, as I guess um, you use um, you know, architectural, spatial, lang or design language to help um, people navigate a space, for instance. Like, you know, door opening is like, oh, there's where for me to go if I go through a door opening. Oh, right. So more like a wayfinding system. So skeuomorphism is used to get the same kind of reaction that you would get from people in a physical space. So in a physical space, someone sees a door, they automatically know that something that can help them go into another space. So then we take that and put that into VR sometimes. So we don't have to teach people a complete new system of symbolism that helps them navigate a space. So if that's what you mean in that context, yeah, I think that's a great example of using skeuomorphism in a, in a positive way. Um, what I found with our work is that it's very important to identify from the beginning what's the role of the virtual architecture in the particular virtual experience that you're working on. Because if you are talking about something like a game, then that audience will probably have a higher interest in being challenged. And then you can be a lot more experimental with what you're doing. So you might not go with this kind of skeuomorphism. You might go with actually teaching people a new way of wayfinding and teaching them new symbolism for how to navigate. Um, whereas if you're working on a virtual experience or you have a client that's something like a platform where people meet to actually do work, so they have like a virtual office kind of platform, then the architecture cannot challenge them too much because they're there meeting with their team and the, their boss and they have to focus on their slides. So they might not have either the mental availability or the time to learn a completely new way to move forward in a space. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think there, there is, in a way, there is different use case and, and for each use case, we need to, to think about how we use the, uh, this element, this uh, symbol of architecture. Um, I, I agree. I mean, also, we, we're talking about interaction. I mean, in the example I show, we, we just use this ribbon because obviously we can, there is no gravity, so we can use a ribbon. And, and then just by lifting it up, it, it is providing an arch. And, and so maybe there is no real interaction, but there is just a suggestion that if there is an arch, there is a different space to go to. Uh, maybe we don't need a door because obviously, uh, so. So yeah, maybe there is a lot of possibility to use uh, these um, symbols, these architectural elements. Um, I don't know, Alex, do you, you have anything to add to, to this? Uh, not on this particular note. There's a, a few other topics I want to uh, focus on when we get to them, but let's let's stay on this thread for a moment. I want to add something very quickly about this image that you have up here. Um, 
I think it's fascinating to start unpacking some of the layers in here. So what we're seeing is one structural layers. So the arch is a different structural element from like the post and lintel structures that you see in some of these examples. And then a lot of examples duplicate the structural system, like the balustrade and the fronton are the same kind of structural system. But what's different is the layer of ornamentation on top of that. So there are different structural systems, different approaches to ornament. And then on top of that, there's different kind of symbolism. So Pierre, it looks like what you picked out of that for the example that you showed is more the last part, which is the symbolism um, that Kim was also referring to. So you're using the arch not in its ornamental or structural qualities, but you're using it as the wayfinding symbol inside the space. Yes, yeah, no, I, I agree. Actually, maybe that was not the best example because the, 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 the title is architectural element. So that actually, when you look into the, the detail, they are more than element, they are, they are almost features. Um, and it's true that when, when you look at really what are the architectural elements, reduce that to what's the minimum of an architectural element. Maybe maybe we, we can go down to the wall, uh, the door, the, the stairs, uh, the window, the arch. Uh, and, and so those are really the essential uh, that we can use to create space. Uh, and here you're right, there is already some, uh, uh, yes, they are assembled. Uh, there are already a few elements assembled. I mean, the, the bottom one, the porch, is, is yeah. the part and, of the whole building. Yeah, just to hammer home that point real quick, I want everyone to just pay attention to the fact that all these architectural elements, they serve multiple purposes. In the real world, you know, uh, things like, like, let's say, a roof, for example. A roof, yes, keeps the elements out. Um, but in a virtual world, you still might want a roof because, uh, yeah, we're just, as we're saying, these are space making tools. These are ways to, to, to find tighter spaces and larger spaces. Um, a window, whether or not it's keeping the rain out, you know, gives you a view to something further away. Uh, columns can provide a sense of rhythm and repetition. And then one example I think of all the time is anytime I've been in a, in a virtual bar in architecture, you know, you have cocktail tables in there and no one actually has a real drink. I mean, they might in the real world, but virtually it's not quite the same. And yet those still serve as congregation points because we're naturally drawn to uh, spots to center around. So a lot of these elements that we use in real world architecture in its geomorphic aspect still do have a role to play in virtual architecture, um, not just because they're familiar, but because there are multiple layers to what they do. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I probably could talk about that and, and start to list uh, more more examples. But I think we, we also bring another another notion here, which is the, the and it's kind of a problem. Uh, it's the, the the sense of scale uh, in VR, and and sometimes we 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 all have uh, experiment this. Uh, sometimes we we don't know. What, what the scale is, like for instance, in this room, we, we feel maybe the room is pretty pretty big, isn't it? And so in a way, those, those architectural elements, you mentioned the the, 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 the balustrade or, or a colonnade could, could bring this sense of scale, or, or maybe we need even to bring more, more detail. I mean, do, do we really need a, a frame in the window or is the frame just a, a way to show the, the scale of the, of the wall? I don't know, Kim, do, do, do you want to have something to say about the, the scale and how to define the scale in VR? Uh, me? Uh, well, um, well, I think that uh, real life um, familiar elements are um, like door openings and, and those are a way to um, create what I would say call a human scale. I mean, there's, there's a lot of architecture that is... Um, brutalistic uh, which have huge door openings very closed facades and things like that so um i'm not i'm not sure if this is the right spot to talk about it but one of the things that i think about a lot when creating virtual spaces is how how do you want 
the person inhabiting the space to feel. And if you're in a space which is very, very tall, uh, very tall openings, the, the, the player or the user will feel small, insignificant, um, very powerful. So I think scale is important uh, in, in how to make somebody feel inhabiting a space. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, we, we, we had this problem if, if I go back to the, the um, to the first space we've created, uh, this, this one actually, the gallery there was really too big. Um, and, and obviously artists, and we, we had the discussion with artists where they, they want to have their art in kind of a real scale format, but then the thing was really too small in the middle. So we had to scale them up. Uh, anyway, um, uh, we had to reduce the space as well. But but I think the the, the other thing as well is if we if we create, if we can start to create space that are not uh, doesn't have nothing to do with real space, we we can also create the space as a journey and and then take the the participants along a, a journey and 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 they can follow the the architecture. Uh, the, I mean there is no. Uh, no, no, no problem of real estate in VR, so, so uh, we can also use this at our advantage. Or, or maybe there is also ways to actually um, play with the scale. You can suddenly be a, a very small or very big. So th this is something we can start exploring. I don't know if you if you ever done that, um, Andrea. Have you have you have you played with scale in, in your project? Not in a client project, but in some private experiments, let's call them that way. I have played with the whole Alice in Wonderland um, effect. So I, I have a bit of a different take on this thing with scale. In physical architecture, human scale is the most important thing, right? You get the scale wrong, that physical space feels absolutely like shit. And when you're in architecture school, and rightly so, the idea that you always have to, to design to human scale is kind of really driven into your head like a biblical rule. Um, and I totally agree with that. I think, however, that in virtual space, the concept of human scale is obsolete. Um, I think we will, in time, and maybe the next generation, will undergo a process of cognitive expansion in which they will learn to live life in various virtual environments where their virtual body, whatever that is, will have different scale, different sizes, different shapes, and different affordances. So that completely throws out of the door the idea that there is one scale which is the right scale. We'll just have to cognitively adapt to that. Um, to a, just the variety. So then what do you design? Like what are good design principles if such a fundamental thing as the scale of your body goes out the window? And the second observation I like to make is the idea of agency over your scale. So it's true if you are, if you feel somehow small and you are in a very tall space that might feel uncomfortable or it might it might bring about feelings that you you do not want in that person but if that person has agency over the scale if they can immediately press a button and control how much bigger they want to get um, then again we're entering a completely new territory and we're entering very interesting discussions between the relationship of the person to the space which is a flexible relationship. And again, Alice in Wonderland, it doesn't really matter if it's you that's becoming bigger or is the building that's becoming smaller. It's like, right, that you can't, you, it's like relative. Um, so, so yeah, all, all of these stuff are some of the incredibly exciting concepts for me in this, in this, um, in this new kind of discussion about this new type of architecture. I think that, that's super interesting. Um, uh, for me, it brings uh, a very imp important and interesting subject, which is the the the, the opposition or the, the the paradigm between the object and the scene. 
um, and in, in cognitive science, and th there is a, a lot to, to say about this because the, the way it's in the way of brain process uh, the scene and process an object is, is actually very different using different uh, cognitive system, um, and and um, so the, it's very interesting. Um, but but I think uh, maybe Owen, I know you you you've been uh, pondering uh, around this this idea of of, uh, of the object in the scene. I mean that's what your work is mostly all about. Uh, and I know we've 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 take your three uh, D sculpture and then because our space is really big, we were able to make them massive. Uh, but obviously when when you think about your 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 art piece uh, the first time in, in a real space, you don't see them maybe that big. So I don't know, how, how do you, what's your take on this uh, notion of scale and also between object and, and scene? I mean, from the, the point of view of, of my work, it's, uh, I think it's possibly just because if I had created the pieces as the physical sculpture, it would be a certain size. So that's why when I when I do the renders or when I build up those replicated scenes, they, they are, I suppose, human scale. Um, but also they're in a human base. So you know, the one inside the room, it's a one-to-one -one scale room. So if I was to make the sculpture the size of a mouse, you know, obviously you wouldn't be able to see it because it'd be tiny, but definitely changed the dynamic when we when we made the sculptures, you know, a hundred foot tall inside the, the other gallery. Uh, made it a bit more grand, but I, I think when I view them as human scale, to me they seem like a, an entity that maybe is trying to communicate with me or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not something that it's not something that I've really played with, with with the work directly because I've just had this idea in my mind of what I want to do with it, and that that's the path I've been going down. Um, then when we put them into your gallery, it, it changes the the dynamic of it, and it's kind of similar to, you know, the the background that I came from traditionally was graffiti and street art. So when galleries started getting Video artists to, you know, to put together uh, physical exhibitions, the dynamic changed because the artwork wasn't the same as what was out in the streets. Um, and then when when groups cut down walls or you know, and then try and place them into galleries, it changes the dynamic again. So it's, I don't know, it's it's interesting to me that you can take one thing and place it in a different space, and it, it loses some of its original uh, uh, draw, but it also creates a new draw. You know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting to me. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think that there is a, there is something about playing with those scale in, uh, in, in VR space. Uh, and, and it's really easy. I mean, in hubs, you can just uh, uh, grab the object in your hand and then change the scale of it, which is pretty cool. But I, I realize that time is flying by and, and maybe uh, we, we would love to have questions from, from the audience that are uh, very nicely uh, listening to us. So please, if you have any questions, raise your hand and, and raise your voice. We, we, we would love to hear what, what you are, um, what you have in your in mind. I think Nicholas was saying in the chat that people should, should not unmute, but uh, please do uh, type questions into the chat. Ah, as much as I'd love to hear everyone's voice. <laughs> yes. Okay. Then, uh, if you write your question in the in the chat, then I will, I will uh, speak it out loud. Um, do I have any in the meantime? While while we're waiting for a question, one thing that uh, I've I've been thinking about during some of these past few discussions. Oh, hello. We have raised hands. Can we call on people? <laughs> Sonia, do you want to say something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, so far, it has been one of my favorite. Um, I'm looking for an advice, actually. I 
I'm a UX designer. Uh, that's my background, and I have been um, in VR for like in the VR industry for like two years. Like I've been building a lot of like environments and avatars and uh, sort of, like those things like that. And uh, me and my partner, we um, we try to build like a small um, community for like world builders. Uh, but one of the questions that we get asked uh, so many times and we are still struggling on trying to answer them is that they were asking about how to trans like how to do the uh, the right transition between being an architect and uh, being an uh, like a builder in the virtual reality and what was your learning curve uh, when you're building in 2D environments where you can see everything um, physically and when you're building um, in like a 3D software like Blender or like Unity, you know, things like that. Um, like you, you guys said about like um, understanding the agency, uh, being able to give user control on that. So I was just uh, trying to get your thoughts on that. Well, that, 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 that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on this. We, we are, that's exactly what we are trying to do as well. It's, it's creating a, a community of, uh, of virtual architects. So the first thing I would say is let's, let's uh, join together. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you're using Discord, but we are starting a, a, a small uh, Discord server where we, we really keen to talk about virtual architecture. So maybe we can, uh, we definitely can uh, have further converse, conversation there. Um, but for me, the most important thing I would say uh, is to, when, once you want to, to use VR, is to, to, to iterate fast and try with real people, whatever you do, and, 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 and have feedback. I think that's really fundamental. So using a platform like, uh, like Hubs is, is, uh, is a great way to test things out and see what works, what doesn't work. But I don't know who else is. We have different takes. Yeah, the, the user testing you can do with VR is pretty remarkable. I'd also encourage everyone as much as possible to design from within VR, um, ideally with, with other people too. There's, there's a number of pieces of software that allow for that, especially in a multi-user capacity, um, match with VR and, and Tilt Brush. There's a great open source version of Tilt Brush right now that is a uh, multiplayer called MultiBrush. Um, because as soon as you're able to actually experience a design at scale, and, and as Andrea was saying, doesn't necessarily need to be human scale, but at the scale you're imagining that it will be experienced, that's entirely different. Uh, because it's, it's kind of absurd when you think about it that for thousands of years architects have been uh, designing in this abstract way with orthographic drawings of plans and sections and, and even renderings to a certain degree, because those are all representing uh, but still in a very abstracted way, what a, a, a spatial experience will be, um, while, uh, of course, the, the end result, of course, is we want people to actually be in these spaces and feel compression and release and how light and shadow and different colors all affect uh, you psychologically and, and how you behave in a space and how you move through a space. Progression being a really important part, too. What's it like to move from one space to another? And so in VR, yeah, step one is, you know, review a lot, get users in there, um, pop into VR and, and look yourself. But I think a lot of people still are stuck in this world of using Blender and 3ds Max and Revit and doing the designing in that program and then just checking it and just reviewing it in VR, which is not the same as actually standing in a space and looking up and saying, yeah, geez, you know, I, I feel like the ceiling's a little bit too high. Let me lower it a little bit and keep lowering it until it feels right. And at that point, I'm using a little bit of, you know, architectural training instinct. But to, to make those decisions while you're in VR is night and day from making them in a, in a 3D piece of software that you're looking at on a 2D screen. I want to add quickly to that. Um, my studio is working on developing a tool that is specifically for architects to design straight in VR. Um, some of the things that we've been unhappy with with the stuff Alex mentioned is that they don't have basic functionality. We would need like punch a hole in a wall and things like that. Um, so we're in the middle of working with that and I'll encourage any of you to just get in touch with me if you're interested in 
being part of the development process, um, where we're trying to figure out what kind of functionalities do we need as architects specifically to design these spaces straight in VR. Um, we'll have like some chats and stuff for everyone to join the development process soon, but if you're super curious in the meantime, um, just drop me a message on Twitter um, and I'll give you access to whatever bill we have right now. Um, and a second thing I want to add is I think if you want to transition from, let's call it traditional architecture to virtual architecture, for me, the biggest challenge is going to be giving up what seems to be the number one interest of traditional architects, which is make some cool shapes that look good from certain privileged angles. Because everyone's been talking some, well, lately people have been talking about the experience of architecture and there's some cool books out there that talk about the smell and the feel and the haptic qualities of walls and stuff like that but if you look at what's actually coming out in terms of actual work and buildings and designs from the major studios they are completely fetishizing privilege renderings renderings from privileged positions uh, they're fetishizing shapes and looks and colors um, they're not really focusing on what it feels like to be in that space. And that has been the case for a few hundred years. Um, there are two main reasons for that. One, we have been functioning as architects under a rationalist paradigm. So rationalism as a philosophical movement has taken over architecture and the rest of the world. Um, and we're just, we, we care quite a lot about functionality and that's a whole nother discussion that I'm not gonna get into right now. Um, and the second reason we just haven't had the tools to make the subjective experience of a space something that's shareable. And now I feel like we are extremely lucky as architects to be living in a time where we finally have this tool. Uh, and I completely expect this tool that allows us to share the subjective experience of space before the space is built to quite radically change the course of architecture. Great, so we, we have uh, a few more minutes. There is one hand raised there and there was a great question uh, earlier, um, but maybe let's go with, uh, with your, with you, uh, is it Nicolas Galvez? Can you, can you? Ah, Hanza, Hanza yes. with the hand there, actually. <laughs> Oh, yes, please, let, what, what's your question? No, hello? Hungry with the raised hand? Maybe you're muted. Not, then I'll read the, the other question. What's there? I'm gonna stay with him on the big chat, maybe. Yes, okay. So there were there was another well, I don't know, yeah, question comment here from Jure Triglaf says we spend our lives adapting to real space and real architecture. How quickly do you think we could adapt to architecture that's liberated from gravity and scale? Uh oops, I lost the I lost the the end of the question. What, if anything, would be gained cognitively from such an adaptation? Well, that's a good question. Very fast. You can change extremely fast. Yes. Um, it's, it might vary a little bit from person to person, and I'm even going to venture some numbers out there. For some people, it could take as little as 20 minutes for the first experience to start to really get into it. For some other people, it might take longer. What's relevant is that these days we have people getting into VR at very, very young ages. So the younger you're exposed to these kind of scale changes, the faster you'll Yes. You'll and perceive it as natural, quote unquote. Yeah, definitely. And there, there are plenty of research uh, on, um, on on avatars and, and, and how you adapt quickly to your body. Like uh, if you if you, uh, you you can find that if you if you have your avatar has a, a tail, uh, you, you will move like you have a tail uh, in in a few minutes, and uh, you will act like you are an animal with a tail. Uh, you, the body is uh, an adapting machine. So yeah, it's it's. 
And I mean, also everyone just think about how quickly we all adapted to using something like a smartphone and this whole idea of apps and how an app is different from a web page. Um, you know, the, the, if something is well designed, especially from the, the UX and UI perspective, people are going to figure it out pretty quickly. But design is always a really key part. You have to do that well. Yes, uh, we have uh, Hansi question here. I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll tell it out loud. So hello, Kyuli. I'm doing some architecture and urban planning projects that relating to bring them to VR, AR, MR environment. Let's say XR. There a big there is a big challenge we usually met is optimizing the model. Yes, especially heritage building with ornaments. Can you share me some experience of you guys to handle this problem? Ah, yeah, so the yeah, optimization is definitely uh, part of the workflow. Definitely, if you use the, the web XR, uh, you need to be really, really light and, and keep your your polygons count uh, very low. Uh, so uh, personally, uh, practically, we're using Blender, which is a fantastic software, and we we are really uh, decimate uh every little mesh uh, as, as low as possible without deteriorating the, the the quality of the of the of the form but yeah it's it's a big part of the of the work there is no pretzels or the, the other ways to actually uh, start from scratch with building very uh cautiously with uh, <laughs> uh and very cleverly with uh, as less polygon as possible uh, and then and then you can always increase the number which would be make life more easy, but we can, yeah, yeah we can have, yeah. I'd also just tell everyone to, to check out Unreal Engine 5 <laughs> if you get a chance. Yes. It's not, not so built for WebXR, but the the Nanite technology is pretty remarkable for what it does yes. with optimization. Yeah, that's another technology coming in for sure. There is always technology uh, bringing, bringing this to the next level as well. Um, but um, I realize we, we are running out of time, um, so I want just to take this this moment to thanks uh, my colleague here. I'm sorry and, to, to interrupt, that uh, Hanze actually had a question. So he, oh, yeah, it's on the private uh, chat. On the private, is it the, the question I just asked? No, because he can't connect to his mic. That's why. Yeah, I just I just uh, mentioned this question right now. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we were we were briefly uh, respond to this, uh, but yeah, happy to discuss this further if uh, if if, uh, if you want to. I, I also uh, did share a, a link to a web page I've created where you can find the details of uh, of everyone here. Um, so please uh, have a look, and if you want to have further discussion, I'm sure. Uh, each of us, you know, own um, and, and, and ways of, of uh, doing XR and virtual architecture. We, we, we're happy to have further discussion. Um, but yeah, I mean, great. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Kim, has disappeared uh, for joining me to this, uh, this panel. And, and thank you, the audience, to be there and, uh, and pay attention to our conversation. I hope. It was of interest, and and I hope we can uh, we can multiply this and have further discussion like this because there is a lot of work for everyone. I don't know if you have any anything else to add. Um, how do we? Uh, I, I accidentally went into the networking rooms, and then I. <laughs> Ah, there we go. I was, yeah, I was closing and saying thank you to everyone. We can probably uh, have a round of applause. <laughs> Ooh, he did it. He did it. Um. Amazing. <laughs> All right, so where do we go from here? Um, the so, suggestion was networking rooms. Yeah, we we can. If there is any anyone who fancy having further discussion.
Um, I have to go. I, I'm apologize. I won't be able to um, to join you in the networking room. But um, thank you so much, Pierre, for organizing this. And um, as you've already said, I'll be more than happy to connect to anyone and and continue this discussion either on Pierre's Discord server or in on other platforms. Great. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I have a quite a busy uh, the afternoon as well, so I'm not going to stay long on the platform here. But yeah, uh, let's keep the discussion uh, going. I know, I know, Andrea is on Twitter as well, um, but platform goes. I'll hang out in the networking rooms for a little while if anyone is. Uh... Yeah, I have twelve minutes, so um, do you know where to go, Kim? Yeah, if you if you click on the go to and networking rooms, then you will immediately uh, be taken there. All right. Great. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation and for this discussion. Um, it's now time for the poster session. So as you may notice, um, we have some offices right after the boardroom here, and uh, the poster presenters can can reach their individual rooms and upload their posters and I invite you all to go around and discuss with the presenters and if you have any question regarding the organization or regarding uh, the uploading of your posters please just let us know and we'll see you around. Great, thank you. Si c'est la présentation de Poster, si vous m'entendez. Oui, Alexandre. Oui. Oui, euh, du coup, il a dirigé vers les networking rooms, mais c'est pas la même chose, on est d'accord Les networking rooms, c'est quoi bah, En fait, quand je fais go to networking rooms, j'arrive ailleurs que le, à Convergence Area. Donc, euh... Ok, et parce qu'en fait, c'est là-bas qu'il faut se rendre pour les posters Bah non, je crois pas. Bah non. Ça. Euh... Donc, euh, du coup, euh, je sais pas. Il a dit ça à un moment, j'espère que tout le monde n'a pas entendu. <rire> euh, bah, en fait, je viens d'arriver, donc euh, <rire> j'ai pas vraiment entendu. Euh... Est-ce qu'il y aurait un autre membre du staff autre part Je vais regarder. Et Olivier Oui. Oui. Du coup, les gens qui sont là, ils doivent se rendre dans les, les, les salles de poster session Oui, idéalement, c'est ce que c est, c est, je ferai les invités à aller, à aller voir. Donc, bon, je bah, pense ok, pas sûr. Ils ont dû rester assis, euh, ils, sont, ils doivent être sûrement en train de faire autre chose, mais tous les gens sont sortis là, donc c'est bon. Oui, bon, je vais voir avec eux. Ok, ça marche. Et donc, on reprend à moins 5 pour le second, le second panel. Bah, le panel s'est bien passé, hein. c'était un peu une inconnue euh, en termes de contenu, enfin, de, de, de comment ça se, se, se passer, ça a bien marché. Oui, c'était bien, et puis bien joué pour la, 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 la transition. <rire> donc, euh, bah, voilà, on reprend euh, donc à 5h moins 5 euh, pour le, le, le dernier panel. 5h moins 5, ok, ça marche. Et là, il y aura Simon, puisque c'est son panel. Enfin, il est oui. dedans. <rire> ça roule. Il est dans les temps. Voilà, bah, à tout. À tout.
Ouais, du coup, euh, Ben. Ouais. Donc 5h moins 5, il y aura le dernier panel. Donc on va inviter les gens qui sont là à aller euh, bah, aux, aux sessions poster là. Le canard, ah bah il y a des sont déjà.
Hi guys, anyone to hear me? Is your mic on? Or type in something on the private chat? You're not supposed to be here anymore. Maybe it's better for you to join your friends on the poster session rooms next to this very boarding room. And they you still here with us?
Simon. Simon. Enfin, oui. re, bonjour. Oui, je suis là. Oh, oui. Il euh, y a encore des personnes qui sont dans la salle. Euh, du coup, euh, est-ce qu'ils attendent pour le prochain panel On ne sait pas. Ils ne me répondent pas. C'est peut-être euh, oui, nettoyer un peu. Non, euh, je sais pas, est-ce qu'il y a des, des gens qui ont été. Euh... Il y a Jeff Jego, il est avec moi, il est juste à côté de moi oui, dans ça, le je monde. Sais, mais <rire> j'ai euh, Hung Day qui ne bouge pas. Ah, Liza, elle est partie. Il y avait Liza aussi. Okay. Et ça marche les posters Il y en a qui vont voir les posters alors euh, Oui, mais il y a des salles, il y en a une, on l'a fait déplacer parce qu'elle était trop loin. J'étais installé euh, trop loin, donc il n'y a personne qui allait jusqu'au bout. Du coup, on l'a fait se déplacer plus près. Et il y a euh, la première salle polyphonique museum. Il n'y a personne qui y va, a priori. Donc, je sais pas pourquoi. T'as vu euh, Suzanne Baer, non Suz Baer Suz... Mmh, Non, c'est quoi ça C'est une, une, une intervenante, Suzanne. Je crois que c'est Suz. Et elle n'est pas censée être là, c'est ça Bah si, elle est censée être enfin, quelque part elle, dans les postes. Elle n'est pas là, c'est ça Ouais. Camille sur l'autre, euh, Paris 8, c'est toi Camille euh, sur l'autre okay. Là en fait, ce qu'il faut, c'est que tu, tu cliques sur la petite étoile. Attends, je vais couper mon micro parce que je suis en train d'expliquer. Je repasse plus tard. Allez. Ouais, Simon, ouais, merci pour, pour Suzanne, hein, parce que la pauvre, elle est un peu seule. Ah oui, tu l'as retrouvée Oui, ouais, elle, elle, elle y était, hein, elle, elle était là. Mais par contre, elle a, elle a du mal à comprendre la, la procédure. Alors, je dis, bah, ce n'est pas vraiment à moi de lui expliquer. Donc, je ah oui, c'est si... ça. Il bah, euh, ouais. bah, faut qu'elle affiche son poster euh, sur l'écran. Et, ouais. euh, et après, elle discute, c'est ça Voilà, ouais, elle explique aux gens euh, voilà, ce que, le, ses travaux, quoi. 
D'accord, bon, voilà, je, vais, je vais lui voilà. dire ça. Je peux lui expliquer, c'est cool. Ok, à bah, plus. Merci. Allo, allo, est-ce que tu m'entends Tu m'entends m'entendez T'es où Jean-François Je te vois pas dans, dans le virtuel. <rire> Bonjour Alain, je suis à table. Oui, <rire> oui, ouais, ça marche, ça marche, je coupe, je coupe. Bonjour.
pour les questions de... J'ai une grosse résolution sur le téléphone, sur le... Attends, je fais une bêtise. Euh... Qui a parlé Vous m'entendez bien Super. On t'entend très bien. <rire> Bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour Jeanne, je vois que tu es là, tu nous entends Je vous entends parfaitement. Super. Est-ce que tu es au courant pour ton PowerPoint, euh, comment le, le, le charger Alors, euh, euh, on m'a expliqué bon. ça hier. Oui. Mais, <rire> mais là, je ne vois pas l'icône en bas à droite. C'est tout en bas à droite, tu dois avoir une icône tout en bas à droite, effectivement, les, ça s'appelle les... Ouais, sauf que en bas à droite, je vois « You are in a private room ». Euh, oui, mais en, juste en dessous ce mot, en dessous le mot « You are in the private room », tu as une petite icône affichée au titre de présentation. 
Eh ben, euh... je n'ai pas de là. <rire> là, je vois celui de Jean-François Gégaud qui est pour l'instant actif. Ouais. D'accord. C'est parce que la sienne est active, c'est ça Peut-être. Je sais pas. Okay. <rire> je sais pas. On va. Parce que c'est vrai qu'elle était là hier et là, je ne vois pas. Voilà. Alors là, c'est quoi C'est toi, Jean-François, là C'était slide. Hein. Parce qu'on nous... Et euh, donc, euh, je, je disais, Jeanne, si tu m'entends, que je, je vais bientôt euh, lancer la, la conférence et présenter euh, euh, le, le début de la conf, et puis, enfin, de la table ronde et puis les, les cinq personnes qui y participent. Et après, ouais. je, vais vous donner, je vais vous donner la parole, après, tour à tour. Je commencerai par les dames, à savoir Indira et toi, d'abord. Et puis ensuite, oh. on enchaînera avec, euh, avec, les, avec Simon, avec, euh, avec Jean-François et avec Vincent. Voilà. Euh, Vincent, il arrive à mettre son PowerPoint, je vois, c'est super. Bah ben ouais, moi j'ai toujours pas le bouton en question, ça m'énerve. Et je n'ai pas le bouton de présentation des, des slides. Il a cliqué sur le... Vincent, ça fait un lien des étoiles. J'ai mis un petit étoile à un moment, mais je sais pas si ça va Pas par quel micro là. Ça se casse. Là, c'est le mien, j'ai peut-être coupé avec mon micro. Ça y est. Oui, Jeanne, tu voulais un coup oui. de main pour charger ta présentation. Euh, donc, en fait, il faut que tu cliques sur un des écrans. Par exemple, l'écran du fond, là, regarde, je vais vers l'écran du fond. Tu vois Alors, l'écran du fond. Que tu ouais. Peux me suivre. Oui, voilà, oui, je, je te vois. Tu... Je te vois, je te Moi, vois. Je regarde, vois. Clique, clique sur l'écran du fond. Alors. Une fois dessus, tu vas voir apparaître sur la droite en bas un petit, un petit menu. Qu'en ferait-il que... Ah, Dieu que du ciel. Super pratique. Alors, voilà. Ah voilà, super. Donc vas-y, clique sur l'écran. Ouais, je il clique sur l'écran. Voilà, donc à droite de ton écran, il a dû apparaître euh, un truc outil de présentation. Un petit menu à droite, euh, une barre noire ou quelque chose comme ça. Une barre noire, ah oui d'accord, ok. Voilà, donc tu cliques sur tout à droite le petit menu euh, déroulant, là, enfin il y a un petit menu avec euh, trois petits traits. Ouais. Et euh, tout en haut tu prends outils du présentateur. Yes sir. Voilà, et donc ça t'ouvre un petit écran à droite, c'est ça Ouais, c'est cool. Voilà, et donc sur ce petit écran à droite, tu as une petite flèche qui monte là à côté de l'écran, entre l'écran et l'étoile, tu as une petite flèche qui monte. Ouais, pour tu applaudir mon truc, ouais. Charger ton PDF. Voilà. Donc tu charges ton PDF, ça va prendre un certain temps. Yep. Et après, une fois qu'il va apparaître à l'écran, tu vas cliquer sur la petite étoile juste à côté pour euh, l'enregistrer. D'accord, d'accord. Là, ça, ça charge Oui, oui, c'est en train de. Il prend le PDF, il fait une conversion, apparemment. D'accord, ah, ah, très bien. Et il génère le, le HTML, tout va bien. Ah ben voilà, le voilà. Ah ben non, ça c'est pas le tien. Non, non, si, si, c'est à moi ça, c'est bon. Ah, c'est à toi ça Bah super, alors clique tout de suite sur la petite étoile à côté de la petite flèche là. Oh ouais. Tu vois, tu cliques sur la petite étoile et il va te faire un onglet. Hello à qui Ah, 
Och det vet vi vad det alors. Donc Jeanne, c'est bon, t'as cliqué sur la petite étoile, est-ce qu'il t'a créé un onglet J'ai cliqué sur la petite étoile, ouais. Et t'as créé un, un onglet normalement. Bon, juste Alors, il a créé de... un onglet, c'est-à-dire bah, Juste sous outils de présentation, il y a un petit truc marqué HTTPS, euh, quelque chose comme ah ça. Bah, en il n'a rien hein, créé du tout, Ah, ça m'énerve ça. Alors, je clique sur la petite qui... étoile. Voilà, ça c'est mon... ma présentation, ouais, ok, bon. D'accord, ok. Alors. Parce que ça, c'est ma présentation. Oui, bon. Mais le problème, c'est que dans l'onglet, c'est toujours google.com dans le truc là-haut. Ah, mais reclique sur l'écran, voir. Bon, ça, c'est. Je clique. Alors, attends, je clique sur l'écran. <rire> je clique sur l'écran. Dans l'outil de présentation, ou bah, ça fait la des, même chose. Il y a des petits soucis bah, J'arrive pas à bookmarker mon truc parce que. Voilà. Alors. Je ne pas me servir de cette interface là. Qu'est-ce que vous voulez faire exactement non, mais On, on l'avait vu ton PDF là à un moment. Donc qu'est-ce que tu... Bon, là, ça c'est ma présentation. Hein. Voilà, okay. super. Donc ça, tu cliques, là une fois qu'on le voit, là, euh, ouais. quand elle est visible, clique sur la petite étoile pour le, la, la mémoriser. Bah écoute, euh, il me dit bookmark this page, mais le problème c'est que dans mon outil de présentation, la page qui est... Euh, qui... Ah voilà, ça y est, maintenant, ok. Pour une raison, voilà, c'est bon maintenant. Je crois ah, que c'est bon. Bon, très bien. Et donc, normalement, maintenant, avec le petit onglet que tu as dans ta page, de, enfin, dans ton outil de présentation, tu vas pouvoir l'afficher sur n'importe quel écran. Donc là, tu peux aller peut-être sur le, sur le grand écran. D'accord. On se dirige, dirige vers le grand écran. Et puis, tu okay. cliques sur le grand écran. Là, tu peux cliquer sur le grand écran et rappuyer sur... Euh, Normalement, le, le petit onglet qui est en haut. Tu vois, moi, là, j'arrive à afficher des trucs qui sont euh, enregistrés dans mes onglets. Quoi. De jute, de jute, de jute. Ouais, ouais. Ok. Ok. Voilà. C'est bon, ça marche Alors, Ça marche. C'est bon. Et eh ben voilà, super. Super. Bon, on peut démarrer. Donc, je passe la parole à Alain Dioré pour démarrer immédiatement. Okay, hello everybody, thank you Simon. Welcome to this panel about training experts in virtual and augmented reality. So this aims to present some of the major training courses in France around virtual reality and augmented reality. So we have uh, five people here to, to speak uh, with you about uh, what do they do with virtual reality teaching and uh, I, I will present you uh, in, in the order. First, Indira Tuvna from UMR Odiasic UTC at Compiègne. Uh, then uh, we see with uh, Jan Vezian from the laboratory liaison from CNRS University Paris Saclay. Then uh, we, uh, we will listen to Jean Francois Jego uh, from R and Technology Image at Paris 8 University. And after we can hear from Vincent Merwes from Ensign Paris. And also we'll be finished with Simon Richier from Ensign Angers. So uh, I have uh, uh, one ma major question for, my, for the five people. Uh, can you briefly present your training around virtual reality? said to us how do you teach virtual reality or augmented reality do you use uh, some particular teaching techniques so we will begin with india from compiègne thank you alain i'm uh, from the university of technology compiègne and we use uh, uh, well compiègne is in the north <inaudible> of uh, paris and it's uh, a university Uh, connected to uh, different uh, universities in the world, like uh, ITSEIS uh, Shanghai or uh, different universities in Europe. And we have a French in engineering degree, five years, and master degrees, and of course PhDs and other uh, further education degrees. And Uh, this engineering training course takes uh, three years after a core uh, curriculum. And in, in this engineering training course, uh, I am responsible for a VR course. 
and I uh, teach to uh, computer science engineering as well as uh, mechanical science. Uh, and I have also uh, a course in uh, uh, master for you uh, user experience design and PhD training. And oh, sorry, oops, I I want to go. Ah. Oh, sorry. So this uh, course for master uh, user experience students is done uh, on a semester. So half of the semester is dedicated on uh, how do we perceive in a virtual environment and how to design interaction in a 3D virtual environment. And at the same time, we try to use uh, some projects developed at the UTC and there is an evaluation of an existing virtual environment with uh, fundamental truths like questionnaires uh, for presence with the NASA TLX questionnaire. And students are able to test uh, projects and to evaluate them and to compare different projects from the point of view of the experience and the interaction. And uh, uh, I do also um, course for um, uh, engineer, uh, engineering, uh, engineering courses, and uh, in this engineering courses, I want to go on. I just asked, oh, well, yes. yes, and half of the semester is also uh, dedicated to the basis of the air, and we use uh, this uh, um, uh, fundamental uh, elements and on the second half uh, semester we uh, developed projects using HMD uh, uh, like uh, the Vive or the Cave because we have uh, immersive room at the UTC. So what we do is to develop the uh, project, to, we test them and students are able to use either uh, different uh, sensors uh, tools. They can choose also to use uh, mixed reality, augmented reality. They can build some uh, sensors. They can do what they want. And the idea is that there are some labs that outside of the lab they can uh, work together and as well uh, they can have some uh, groups between themselves and they can work also with master students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, please uh, leave the room and don't click on the, uh, the screen because it is uh, you, you. You change the screen on the side of the, of the speakers. So please don't click on the screen. Please. Thank you, uh, Diana. If you can speak now about your teaching. Okay, I will gladly speak about my work if I can manage to put up my slides yet again. Uh, which I seem to have trouble. I don't want to upload my file again. Uh, I thought I would bookmark the thing, but I have a pres problem with this presentation tool. I'm awfully sorry. I'm not very good at it. Um, no problem. Please uh, click on the bookmark or upload it again. Just click on the screen. But please, nobody else click on the screen. <laughs> Um, yes, except my bookmark seems to have disappeared for some reason. Um, Can you upload it again? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm awfully sorry. It's going to be uh, take a few seconds to upload it yet again. Uh, hopefully it's going to be quicker time. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, very briefly, I will tell you who I am. Oh, well, what's happening now? Um, it's like probably I clicked. I'm really not very good with this thing. What is up? 
Uh, I think uh, it's difficult to go up. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, I don't know when I. Maybe I you should can refresh the screen, maybe. I can refresh the screen. Yeah. Uh, I'm awfully sorry. I, I'm I'm very clumsy. Or it's okay, Jerry. Yes, we, it's okay we, now. We, we, yeah. we see your presentation. Nobody click. I <laughs> <Please. can't... laughs> yes. I can't see it on my screen. Uh, you we you see, have we to, see it. to refresh your your screen. I think. Oh, <laughs> how do I how do I do that? Uh, top right, the little button. Uh, top right. Oh God! Top right use on the, the refresh itself. option on the top right corner. Um, my screen come goes uh, we are black all the time, so I can't read. Really you uh, sorry, Dan. You can explain. Uh, perhaps you, 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 I I try to to follow you with your screen. Speak about your uh, make your okay. speak. I, I try to follow. Uh, okay. I am, uh, yeah. Because the, I, I I'm sorry. Too. I can't see my um, I can't see my yes, own slides yes. in the virtual environment. So it's I, very difficult to guess. I, okay. I am on the summary of the screen too. Who uh, teaching IR, teaching VR, and, and the future. Okay. 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 So um. Let's go to the uh, slide three, okay? Uh, so who I am? I'm Jean Vézien. I'm a research engineer in uh, the lab which is called Listen, which is the Laboratoire Interdisciplinaire des Sciences du Numérique. This is a new lab which actually comes from the fusion between uh, the two former labs on the Paris-Saclay University, uh, formerly LIMSI and LRI for people who, in the kn who know it anyway. Uh, this laboratory covers a very large area of activities, but uh, our team has been doing virtual and augmented reality since 2001. Uh, actually, I've been doing augmented reality for uh, even longer than that, but let's, let's skip all the PhD and all that stuff. I've been teaching VR and AR in a number of engineering schools, uh, in the masters, in particular in the masters of the University Paris-Saclay, which is a human computer interface master. And I also do professional training for about, uh, for a total of uh, about 100 hours per year. So I have a somewhat extensive uh, experience in teaching VR and AR and there are some things that I noticed, so uh, let's go to uh, slide number four. Um, is that okay? Do you see slide number four? Ye yes, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, great. Okay. Um, now, VR and AR are, be are becoming more and more commonplace, especially for students, uh, uh, but uh, there is usually what I call the I can make AR on my smartphone effect. That is, uh, most students uh, can Im imagine that augmented reality is about uh, putting virtual stuff uh, on top of the webcam of their smartphone. Um, but I think, as I say here, that a passive augmented world that is just, you know, putting overlaying virtual stuff on, real on the real world is just what I call glorified advertisement. Uh, that is, you can put anything on the real world and it just looks like augmented reality. Uh, so I try and demystify that by saying that for me, the emphasis is on interaction. If you don't have interaction in augmented reality, you don't have augmented reality. So I, of course, I do teach how to make that visual augmentation and uh, how to create that augmented reality effect, including on smartphones, even if I don't like them very much. Uh, but I spend a lot of time teaching the importance of tangible interfaces, of 3D sound, and of haptics in general. That is basically all that standard uh, augmented reality APIs do not provide currently, and that's a shame. Uh, because I think they are uh, very important. They're actually crucial to an AR experiment. So, uh, of course, I do some technical teaching, programming, and, and all that sort of jazz, but 
that's not a very important thing for me. I make an extensive use of animes uh, because I think Japanese animes are great. First of all, to focus the attention of students, usually they pay attention to it. And second, animes are great because they usually focus not on the technical part of augmented or virtual reality, but they actually focus on action and usage in general. So they are great to actually exemplify how people are likely to use augmented reality in future uh, situations, including everyday situations. Here you can see an image from the anime Deno Coil, uh, where John, John, you, have, you have uh, two minutes again, two minutes again for, for yeah, for yeah, 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 that's image. fine. Yeah. So okay, so I have a focus on using multimedia information and teaching the importance of tangible interface. Okay, next slide. Um, now, uh, regarding VR, um, the problem is for me is a little bit different because I want to do teaching with VR. Not, uh, of course, I do teach VR, but I want to do teaching with virtual reality. And I'm particularly interested in teaching knowledge, not procedures. VR is very good at teaching procedures, showing people how to do stuff in virtual world and then they can do the same thing in the real world. But I want to teach knowledge and knowledge is rather a rather difficult thing to grasp because you need to identify what to learn and this is the job of didactics so i work with uh, professors specialized in didactics uh, of different specialties including physics uh, but also what to unlearn because people have misconceptions about knowledge they think they know some stuff and it, it turns out they don't know them so you want to actually quickly go past the wow effect of vr and then use it to truly make them learn something. And making them learn something means you must evaluate often what they do and precisely. So I make an extensive use of very traditional uh, tools like questionnaires uh, in order for them to, to really know very often if they really learn something new with VR. And finally, what is important is that you don't want to put the teacher in the trash can. Uh, because VR is usually a pretty immersive experience. Students tend to feel a little more isolated and the teacher has a problem knowing what they're doing and what they're learning. So um, I want the teacher to be involved in the uh, VR teaching experiments and that's why I want to include actually avatars or any form of you know, teacher within the simulation. That's very important for me. So okay. Okay, thank you, Jan. Yeah, we'll thank talk about the future with my next slide yes, later yes. on. Yes, okay? yes, we, we will talk about this uh, after. Yeah. Thank you, okay. thank you, Jan. Now we can listen to Vincent Merves from Ensam Paris. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I just need to switch the presentation. So maybe I will have to click. Yes, perfect. Uh, uh, so thank you. Um, oh, my name is Vincent Merves. I'm from uh, Ensam. Uh, it's uh, our métier. Uh, Science and Technology School, Engineering School. I'm not located at exactly at the same place as Simon because Simon is exactly on the same uh, same school. Uh, I'm located in uh, Paris. Maybe I can change the slide. Yes, and uh, we are located in, um, in the back part of the of the uh, school in Paris. And uh, the laboratory where I uh, working is a laboratory de conception, produit innovation, and we. The main theme of research is the design and, and uh, innovation process improvement and optimization. And we directly go from the idea to the product. That's exactly what, we, uh, what we're doing, uh, what we work with uh, inside this laboratory. Uh, why I speak about the laboratory for uh, training uh, session? Because uh, we uh, ask, uh, we focus our training on research, on research project, and the laboratory have a strong part on, uh, on teaching. So the aim uh, topic of research is understanding and formalizing uh, the design and innovation process and construct also some theoretical models in order to uh, well manage project and so on. I try to change the slide. So we have several kinds of skills and expertise uh, because we have uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, inside the lab. I just uh, put a cloud of, uh, of word in order to have all these uh, this skills. 
try to make it very quickly. So this is a, actually a localization. So uh, we have some platform, virtual reality platform, electronic development platform, also a material tech, uh, a library of many kinds of, uh, of materials, and also uh, rapid manufacturing things like a fab lab with uh, uh, printing, 3D printing uh, device and, uh, and so on. So uh, actually we are not specialized in virtual reality. Oh, sorry, just like before, sorry. I don't know how to move back. Yes, thank you. Uh, we are not specialized in virtual reality, but we have two uh, master of science. Uh, uh, one on design and innovation process and another one in interaction process that is not focused on virtual reality but focused on how to design interaction and how to manage interaction. Two master two level and we are also some what we call specialized master. It's a master that you can uh, intend after your, your, uh, uh, your engineering school uh, based on quality, ma maintenance, uh, innovation, business. Uh, sorry, it's Change. Yes, and uh, digital engineering project. And there is some uh, immersive uh, notion uh, that take place in just some uh, training. So we have uh, many uh, students with several kinds of skills, uh, designer, uh, ergonomist, and so on. And we are making projects in uh, many kinds of, uh, of uh, company partners company that can uh, enhance, in fact, the uh, goal and the objective on, uh, on student project that can use uh, virtual reality. So I will switch the slide. Yes, this is a sector of activity. Yes, next slide. Sorry for the... And how do you teach virtual reality? And I would like to make some focus point on how teaching virtual reality and maybe it's quite tips and tricks on it. Um, and first, uh, virtual reality can have several kind of, uh, of, uh, of moment in terms of the training period. You can have some courses, have also during project, project uh, with uh, teams of students and also project with uh, company partners and uh, we can have also an expertise uh, in order to uh, uh, follow the student inside uh, this company. And it's also one, uh, one training period for, for such kind of... Uh... So, uh, in terms of tips and tricks, I would like to... Uh, I try to make uh, a small exercise before starting uh, the virtual reality uh, uh, courses. Uh, it's not my ID, it's an ID that I, that uh, uh, Sebastian Kunz uh, gave to me. It's uh, uh, ice breaking with, uh, you have many cards and you have, you ask your student to uh, classify the cards and there is some diff several kind of, uh, of categories. Uh, the cards can handle from uh, hardware uh, thematics, books, movies, stories, or dealing with virtual reality, software, publication, and artwork also. Uh, and it's very interesting because you can, with this classification, you can discuss with students in order to uh, see how the technology uh, evaluate and how the ID is, uh, is uh, inspired over ID and so on in, in time. And it's very interesting to make a man mapping from this kind of a little game. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Sebastian for this ID because I think it's very interesting, uh, interesting one. Um, after this, uh, generally my courses is mainly based on industrial problematics because we have many models. We have uh, computer uh, edit design uh, software and so on, and we need to have a virtual reality simulation. So I try to uh, show to the student that you can ha have to deal with such of kind of data and try to uh, handle such all these different kind of data in order to create an experience. The experience is not uh, uh, mainstream one. You have to design the experience for your application and for your objective of evaluation. That's why. I introduce also during my courses what we call the three 
I2 model approach in order to specify which kind of immersion and interaction you have to deal with in order to construct your experiences and your evaluation of your project. Further, because it's very well known. So understand how user feels and perceive things. I try to uh, analyze also how you can interact in virtual and, and real world and how you can perceive product, how you can perceive things through virtual reality and so on. So I try to discuss with students on, uh, on such kind of topic. And slide, I go very, 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 uh, very quick. Uh, you can also make uh, some storytelling things. And storytelling is very uh, common tool for uh, defining action and defining usage of product and so on. But in fact, it's very action centric on, uh, I leave it in French, it's very based on action and not on people and user. And uh, I try to introduce to the student another kind of of uh, handling this kind of uh, uh, storyboarding with, in fact, zoocentric uh, point of view in order to analyze how people perceive things and how you can deal with interaction and how you can uh, uh, perceive, in fact, the true virtual reality. So there is also a little trick in order to make sketch and make some exercise with paper, sheet of paper, because we are not really use a computer at the beginning or during the courses. And uh, this little tool is, in fact, uh, a sketchboard when you can sketch some, uh, some uh, hypothesis of uh, action and so on. It's quite uh, a uh, storyboard, but you can make it in 3D when you scan. You can put it in 3D uh, all around the user. And now, if you have uh, technology, uh, if you have a uh, tracking system and so on, you can also now draw in space, like, uh, in fact, many uh, artists who create some, uh, some uh, forms through line. In fact, your brain are able to project information and create some forms. So you have many things now with Tilbrush who already make this. We try to uh, assess such kind of of work uh, with research project on sketching and so on. But now I think uh, tool are, I don't know, fresh, yes, I don't have a feedback. How? yes, it's a video, but it doesn't work because it's a PDF. So uh, this is a, a kind of uh, exercise what we ask for students in order to prepare it to how to uh, handle uh, virtual reality and, uh, and interaction. So uh, now there is some common tool uh, that you can find in uh, markets uh, like uh, Gravity Sketch. But I think I think uh, there is a research project, and Simon maybe make uh, teasing on it with time to concept, who have time to sketch. And there is many research projects on it, many things to do on such kind of uh, approach and how to learn to use such kind of tool in terms of how you can make some storyboarding, how you can handle it uh, in order to prepare uh, uh, interactive content. So I completely lost in my, <laughs> in my presentation. So we have a, a, a technical platform. Yes, now I find my, my slide. We have a technical platform with restricted area with also a public uh, area. Students are able to go inside the public area in order to test and manage experiences. And the restricted area is more for developing and observing uh, the things. So you have an observation room in order to observe how the students uh, work. And also uh, a uh, development room, in fact, where you can develop electronics and something if you want to uh, develop new uh, kind of uh, interacting tool and so on. So that's, I think, all. Just a sneak peek of many kind of, of tools. And we use it in research project in order to go to the ID to the 
real things. So we use virtual reality in order to uh, test and, uh, and evaluate uh, the behavior of uh, a drone, a surface drone uh, like a boat in order to make inspection uh, inside a, a very large pipe uh, underground. And uh, we use virtual reality to analyze how user and how we can handle the product and then we can iterate with virtual reality in order to prepare and make the good choice on uh, on the final product, in fact. That's all, I think, because I'm on the next hour. Okay, yes. okay. thank you very I much. I finished on Vincent. it. Thank you, thank you. And now we can listen to Jean-François Jégaud from uh, RM Technologies d'Image and uh, InRev Laboratory at uh, University Paris 8. Hi, thank you, Alain. So I'm, I'm loading my presentation. So you're supposed to see the first slide. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. So, um, so I'm happy to present after Vincent because uh, we used to teach together virtual reality at Paris 8 a few years ago. And uh, in fact, I'm, I'm presenting something that is uh, less practical. Uh, I, I will talk about sensors, hardware, software also, but I try to analyze the way I teach at Paris 8 since uh, 2010. So it's been uh, 11 years now. I'm teaching VR and AR at, at uh, the department Art and Technology d'Image. So uh, our department was uh, created uh, in 1984 and we are training computer graphics uh, to students and then students uh, can choose to go to industries like animated movies, visual effects, video games, uh, VR and AR and also uh, as uh, independent artists for uh, present installations, uh, digital artworks and performance. So our motto is kind of uh, also close to the one of John Lasseter uh, who used to say that art used to, ch to challenge technology and technology inspire arts. So we are, uh, since we are teaching arts at university using technology, we are quite close to this uh, philosophy. Um, the audience we have is, uh, we have mostly bachelor and master's students at the department, but now we are also teaching for uh, um, master students, which is a, um, a, a six year or a year after the master's degree and also a PhD students. And what used to happen now is uh, we have mixed groups of uh, students, sometimes between bachelor and masters and also between uh, master and PhD students. So we have to adapt our courses to, uh, to, be, uh, to fit these different audiences. And uh, what also is happening is, is um, I used to do some uh, many exchanges and to teach in different countries and cultures. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, it's not really always easy to uh, teach uh, VR and AR, uh, depending of uh, the, the, um, the country. Uh, for instance, uh, it happened one, one time, the country where I was has very limited access to internet, so you have to be really prepared to bring all your uh, software with you because you, you can't uh, download anything when you're uh, with the student. So. Uh, there are some constraints that uh, also are dependent from the place where you teach. Uh, about my method, uh, in fact, I try to quickly analyze uh, how I do it, and I call that uh, simple. <laughs> um, so the C is uh, about first collective dreams and concerns about the medium, because uh, with the students, uh, my first question in the course is to ask them, what is VR for you and what uh, is evocating uh, to you. So the idea is to collect all the uh, ideas from the students, with the movies, the, the books, everything they have seen, learned and tried about VR. Also to discuss about what is dystopia and utopia because this technology uh, is really uh, uh, sometimes inspiring and, and sometimes um, uh, freaking people. So first thing to do is to collect uh, information about uh, the audience. The second uh, thing I used to do is to uh, bring some demos and ask uh, people who have never tried uh, VR or, or AR to uh, try it and uh, to try different uh, helmets, hardware, software. 
and to try also different situations because some VR applications like 360 videos are sometimes uh, very passive. You are just uh, sit down and uh, you can't uh, really uh, interact with the content. So the idea is to show them and explain to them why they try the application, what is uh, interaction, what is immersion, and what is agency where you can uh, uh, use stuff, and uh, what is embodiment when you don't have a, a body and, and when you have a body. Um, the third uh, step is to make uh, them analyze the, what they have tried and to, um, especially in arts, uh, try to make emerge what are the specificities and the, the singularity of the medium. For instance, uh, I used to present to them the Oculus Quest demo with the little robot in, um, you are in space, in fact, and you are in the in a very old, uh, 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 how to say, it's an old car, and uh, so it, it's the past, but you are floating in space and you can interact with floppy disk and generate uh, like a 3D printing, you can generate content. So when they try the demo, I explained to them, okay, you can play with space and time, you can play with gravity, you can create paradox. Um, in this demo, there is a hypercube. Uh, in reality, in the real world, it's really hard to show what is a hypercube. And in, in VR, you can present 3D and 4D and four dimensions uh, objects uh, and interact with them. So uh, this is something that can emerge from practicing with some demos. And uh, the second um, is the question of telepresence. Uh, the idea is to, to present especially VR as a social medium and uh, where, you, where you can create also a collective experience. Four, four uh, points is uh, I, I ask them to practice uh, personally and to try different hardware and software. And when you have, uh, for instance, uh, Kinect, Leapmotion, uh, Oculus, uh, Vive in the same room with 30 students, uh, you can't present yourself all the hardware. Uh, India uh, said very preciously, you, I asked them also to um, individually try one sensor and then present it to the rest of the class uh, using the flipped classroom uh, system. So the teacher is no more uh, presenting all the hardware and software. The students are exchanging and, and presenting to themselves. So then we can um, go to the fifth point with the collective practice, uh, live collective practice, where I asked them to to create groups and to create projects during the class. And when they decide to use uh, a specific hardware or software, they know that uh, in the class, another student uh, acquired the, the um, uh, expertise on, on the device he presented uh, during the flipped classroom. So it's a really time saving on one hand and for the students, they are becoming experts uh, without knowing uh, <laughs> without, uh, um, let's say, uh, asking them to be an expert. And the last and uh, final point is to ex engage the experience with others. So when they have created a, a collective uh, project, the idea is to share it to the class first, then to experiment uh, it and to uh, debunk or debug it if necessary, then to present it to colleagues or family. And of course, if the project is very interesting, to uh, present it to festivals. So every year we have a project that are selected, especially at Laval Virtual. So for instance, uh, this year we have the group uh, Pabulum, uh, who is presenting uh, in the conference hall in Laval. So you can uh, talk with them and uh, ask them uh, how, they, how they create and etc. So it's something I think interesting for the students to, to understand the whole pipeline to create a project um, from the first ideas to the uh, experience, uh, giving the experience to, to, to others. And my uh, output for the future, uh, so maybe uh, regarding our medium, um, I think that classroom are not really convenient to teach VR. I wish we have uh, stages like theater or or cinema stages, because this is in, in fact what is happening in the movie industry. Uh, we are doing now virtual projections where real-time technologies are more and more present and uh, um, used in, in the context of performance. Uh, the second thing I see is that about the content, we should look at uh, artificial intelligence, for instance, to generate or animate uh, relevant content depending of your experience. And the idea is to maybe think more about the spectators and the person inside VR or AR 
and maybe AI could help to do some tailor-made experiences. This is one of my uh, expectations. The second point is to make things more hybrid, um, especially we, we can mix real and virtual objects, humans, environment. Um, don't hesitate to bring and to play with the frontiers between the different technologies. Uh, especially at the Recto Verso Festival in Laval, uh, Judith Guez is really uh, investigating this question of uh, mixing real and virtual together. And if it is creating uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, experiences, in fact. And the third one and last one is uh, the question of high tech uh, and low tech, because as university, in fact, we don't have all the hardware we would like, uh, and we manage uh, to, uh, to do better with less. And uh, I think it's important to teach also that in terms of sustainability, uh, especially in the ecological context. Uh, also to talk about uh, hardware and especially in the countries who don't have access to this um, hardware and software. So I think yeah, we have to communicate about that. And uh, that's, that also raised the question of ethics uh, because the medium is really, uh, in fact, powerful. So what happened when you put a human into a VR system? It's not that, uh, in fact, uh, trivial and uh, it has a real effect on the human brain and body. And the final point is uh, the question of posterity because we really have uh, trouble to maintain our artworks year to year. Um, digital, um, since we can copy files, uh, we think it's completely eternal, but the problem is uh, completely <laughs> the opposite. Uh, we have really difficulties to, to, to keep our hard work, artworks and technology uh, uh, maintained in the in long time. So for the future, we have to think also about that. Uh, if you want to have a look at uh, how we do the, the process at Paris 8, we are organizing a creative jam this week at the Lycée Ambroise Paré in Laval. So don't hesitate to have a look and talk to the students uh, who are actually creating and they are exhibiting in the Lycée, at the Lycée, uh, this weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-François. Thank you, Jean-François. Now we can listen to Simon Richier from Ensam uh, Angers. Yes, Ensam Angers and Laval, <laughs> most, most, most of the time. Okay, thank you, Alain, to have uh, organized this panel because uh, we never shared our practices and it's very interesting uh, to, uh, to discover what uh, everybody is doing. Then we are in uh, Ars de Métier Laval Institute uh, in the beautiful building of Laval Virtual Center with 40 master students and we have 15, around 15 engineer and researcher, researchers, including uh, PhD student uh, yeah, in that beautiful building. Uh, so, in few words, um, as uh, Vincent told you, uh, we are uh, at Arts et Métiers, 6,000 students um, in, um, in, uh, in France, it's the number one uh, public engineer school. And then we are in Laval, the last uh, entity of uh, Arts et Métiers in uh, 2015, uh, 2005. Okay, and so uh, we are also a research team and uh, that's what we study um, in, in the lab. It's more, uh, please stop clicking on the screen, thank you. Uh, optimization of factors uh, affecting user experience in immersive environments for ideation, project review and training activities. Uh, okay, you go. So uh, a lot of uh, title of uh, multi PhDs that uh, we were driven in Laval. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what about the students? The students are the students of uh, the master, uh, master one and master two management of interactive three D technologies. Uh, we put um, the word management at the at the beginning because uh, at the final year uh, we have to train also our students on management technique and how to, to deal with a, a team, a team of multi-competency and so on. Then um, what is uh, our main uh, issue, or main uh, specificity is that we are on project-based learning. And I think in uh, the Arts and Métiers group, we are the most advanced on that because uh, our students realize, realize a lot of, uh, of project. Uh, so, 
Okay, then, uh, yes, we are very glad to introduce you some uh, great uh, diplomi of uh, our uh, master as a French Lasson, co-founder and CEO of Visionary 777 in Hong Kong, or Alexandre Boucher, that uh, you know probably, uh, actually uh, on uh, his booth uh, in uh, Laval Virtual Exhibition, managing uh, the, the director of uh, Clarté. Okay, and so many, so many others uh, in different uh, company uh, in France, and uh, other other guys, uh, Benjamin, you can find in uh, our booth on uh, our virtual exhibition, Art de Métier M Valor booth, and uh, Geoffrey yeah, uh, co-organizing uh, that uh, event. Uh, okay, and that was uh, two great masters. Students, uh, there was a major of their of their uh, team, and so uh, that uh, we are very proud of them. Okay, then uh, 300 graduate students, 20% uh, already holding uh, a diploma of engineer, already engineer, already master. So uh, they, they come to Laval from for one year or two years to to go on in virtual reality. Uh, then I and I go on uh, project based pedagogy as I. Said uh, 11 project over two years. Uh, it's a great amount of project because uh, you have project on uh, one week, uh, you have project on three months, and so on. And, uh, and the very last project is a uh, VF team. Uh, it's an amazing project. Uh, during two weeks, our uh, students, master one, first year, and second year, uh, design a new new application a new experience i would say maybe maybe a, a bit of an experience and uh, it's possible to 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 try the experience for example right now during the professional day of laval virtual uh, you have um, pinky life and sorcery game on uh, two booths uh, very impressive experience just uh, go and try it and uh, to the students you will see they have plenty of idea and uh, a lot of skills in uh, vr and so uh, please uh, stop clicking on my uh, slide because it's very complicated to find where i am okay and uh, we will see three more projects this weekend because we have five uh, teams of uh, students involved in involved in laval virtual okay and we have also internship of course uh, and so on autonomy and uh, yes the premises are accessible 724 i think it's very important all the students can have the, the card to to go in the uh, Laval virtual center when they want okay thank you to click on the screen okay and uh, just uh, to the left uh, some of the courses uh, programming uh, human interface uh, uh, computing a uh, lot of uh, how to use all the type of interface we are uh, very lucky at Laval virtual center we have all the last interfaces last uh, headset and so on and it's a very very nice place to uh, to study real-time rendering 3d graphic and research methodology because it's also a research master then you can have a phd you can start a phd just after your master just a few last slide uh, we go in all sectors of activity when they um, join us uh, usually students uh, want to be in the video game sector and uh, after quickly they change their mind because the salary is higher in uh, industry on uh, all, uh, all the sectors and uh, we have uh, around three job per students and uh, it's a uh, wonderful right now okay and uh, you have also professionalization contract uh, for companies and the students can work uh, for one year or two years for companies and they are, they are paid during the two years of uh, studies and it's very interesting for uh, students sometimes uh, needed uh, money then uh, public school and again uh, professionalism contract it's it's a it's a good step okay Jen, i stop here now Anna, it's up to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon. And uh, now we listen again to Indira and Jan from Soma Ideas from the future about uh, virtual reality and virtual and augmented reality uh, on teaching. Indira, if you can uh, say something. Yes, uh, thank you, Alain. Uh, I think that uh, since we began to uh, teach reality, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, the technology, of course, has evolved, and we can see now that we have a, 
the maturity of the technology and we have also the possibility to avoid errors and that was uh, uh, what you said all, all of you uh, how to uh, design an application and how to be from the beginning uh, aware of the difficulties so the difficulties are not in uh, the uh, integration of the tools because now we know how to use a 3d engine and how to teach and uh, even uh, a very beginner can learn easily how to use a 3d engine uh, again with the sensors it's uh, very easy now to begin a, a new application and to uh, use for example steam vr or to use uh, a new device but the difficulty is to have an intelligent application easy to use and uh, user friendly and how to use uh, the the tools now uh, you have to uh, give um, first experiences and also to let the students do uh, their own experiences using uh, for example bad applications and trying, for example, you try to select an object between different objects in a group of objects, and you see that you need the feedback, you need the, um, to see uh, or to hear a sound or to see uh, the bounding box. If you are not able to uh, decompose it all the uh, interaction in small, small part, then uh, it will be difficult to evolve. So the first steps, uh, I think are um, that now for the future we have to uh, to go over these difficulties and insist on these uh, very uh, evident obvious errors and I think that uh, what you mentioned uh, Jean-Francois is very important about the green VR and how to reuse some uh, old devices, how to reuse uh, some sensors, how to go to, uh, towards uh, sustainability. And uh, we mentioned also in our uh, think tank about uh, the, the future of VR, uh, human take. What would be a human take uh, to learn from the beginning that um, you need to uh, integrate that uh, the user will have uh, to um, uh, take very uh, quickly um, in hand this application. So I think that uh, the rules have changed. Now we can uh, jump over the technology and we have to evaluate. And that's why I am very interested in uh, this um, uh, master of uh, user experience design because we do not design and realize the applications in VR. We do it for, for the engineering uh, uh, course, but uh, the implication of uh, user experience design approach is very important because usually you have the computer science on one part and then you have human factors on the other side. In design, it is different, but I am, in, I am from an engineering school, a very traditional one with mechanical engineering, computer science, and the human factors doesn't exist from the beginning. And now it is not possible. Thank you very much, Indira. So, uh, John, do you want to, to add something? Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's pretty complementary to what Indira just said. Um, yes, true, we have VR systems, we have software, we have hardware, but as I was explaining, I am not, and I will make a big emphasis on not, satisfied by the current state of interfacing that VR has with, human, with humans in general. That is, I think you, VR interfaces are really, really still in their infancy. You need these 3D controllers and you, you have a certain number of tools, but you are not free to interact with objects the way you can do in, in, uh, in reality. So I think the current VR systems in general need to be more open to the creation of new interactors. And that's why I was emphasizing the need 
for um, for tangible interfaces in general and the introduction of 3D sound as well and haptics in general so that the systems can really take into account new interaction tools whichever they can be the users can invent them themselves we do that in HCI we have a, a human computer interface you know uh, course so it's you know pretty specialized but um, students love it and it's it really emphasizes the fact that VR uh, a truly usable VR experience comes with a set of customable interfaces. Uh, and what is linked to that is that I always want to make the time spent in VR, in the VR experience, a truly useful one. Useful being enjoyable or truly useful from an engineering point of view, but time must be well spent in VR. And sometimes you spend an awful lot of time doing things which are not crucial to either the task or your, the enjoyment, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, and to do that, we need more evaluation. We need to have some, maybe not standardized, but at least some well-established framework to truly establish whether VR is truly good for the experience that is targeted. And uh, I am specialized in teaching and I'm trying to find out how VR can be used in teaching. So that's just an example, okay? But uh, I was faced with the problem that I had no idea whether the VR tools I was using, I was trying to use, were of any use for teaching. And it so happens that so far my results are pretty disappointing, actually. That is that people are very good at learning procedures. They can learn, you know, pretty fine gestures and such. But in terms of true knowledge, uh, the acquisition is slow and uh, it, it's really unsatisfactory for now. So either the tools I'm using are not good enough, that's a possibility, or I am not good enough at evaluating the things so I can change my tools quicker. So that's it. I want really to emphasize as well the need of, for evaluation of other many human factors. I mean, how you learn things, but also how, how present you feel, how enjoyable it is, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm done. So, okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeanne. And uh, perhaps uh, nothing more, Jean-Francois, Simon, okay. Perhaps uh, we have some questions in the room. Do you have, uh, perhaps we, we can take uh, one or two questions. If you have some questions in the room for our speakers. No question? Uh, on the chat, maybe, no? On the chat, uh, I look at on the chat, but I don't see any question. No. So uh, now no. we just uh, conclude for this uh, panel. Mm -hmm. So, so if Simon, if you want to do yeah, to yeah, something. Short, short, short sentence to, to conclude. Uh, I said, uh, Indira, I think uh, we do, we was with was with a Laval Virtual Visionary Think Tank uh, on Monday and Tuesday, and uh, we, we talk about VR for all, and uh, we talk about human and sustainable tech. And I think uh, our student uh, wants, want, want that, wants sustainable, want to save the planet and so on. And uh, maybe the thematic uh, VR for all, uh, mixing uh, of so, uh, human sciences and computer sciences uh, could be uh, uh, very interesting and uh, maybe another point is to uh, the use of virtual world we are we are in virtual world and you it was an amazing experience here because uh, we we are in the same room here is the panelist and uh, well it's not easy with our mic uh, you see uh, the problem with uh, jan uh, for a technical problem and so we are at the, at the first beginning we are the, at the beginning of the virtual world and i think there's so many things to to improve uh, for the virtual world and to teach in virtual world to use virtual world and think uh, okay that's my last thought if you want to yes actually uh, i completely uh, agree with with you all I, what i uh, in fact uh, realize is that it's necessary to be really pr project based uh, with this uh, technology because Teaching only a uh, theoretical aspect of it uh, is really abstract. Uh, I tried recently to teach to a company uh, without practicing because of the uh, um, pandemic uh, context. We could manipulate uh, hardware and it, it's, it doesn't make sense for people to 
to to uh, practice uh, to, to understand VR without practice. So, yeah, definitely we we should uh, invite students to uh, to put the hands on and also to exchange the good uh, the good uh, process, the good uh, the tips, uh, everything they learn from their set to share it with with others. So the idea is to also invite them to um, to become experts of their own uh, uh, technologies and don't hesitate to share it with uh, the group uh, because this is obviously what is happening now when they go into companies they are not alone uh, at their desk they they are here to also uh, work uh, collectively so this since this technology is complex uh, we have to invite them to yeah uh, share the practice and uh, share also the way they uh, are uh, doing uh, VR from the technology as uh, technological aspects to also human uh, human factors aspects and in our case at Paris 8 uh, artistic aspect uh, or innovative aspect or creative aspect okay, okay. thank you thank thank very much for Francois India you want to say something yeah I think that uh, we had the time of uh, uh, only uh, uh, digital uh, teaching with the COVID and maybe with uh, VR we are going to re-embody uh, re the, the digital uh, uh, teaching because uh, with VR we can use our body, we can move, we can uh, uh, be uh, a complete uh, human being. So what I think is that uh, when you teach mathematics, for example, when you teach abstract concepts, now with VR you can teach uh, more uh, tangible things, you can uh, uh, go further and you can give the, the understanding of very uh, difficult things like uh, biology, or uh, history, geography, by living experiences. So on one side, I think that there is a massive, massive importance and there, there will be a massive um, deployment of VR for teaching as a tool for understanding lots of uh, uh, difficult uh, fields, very abstract fields, and I think that uh, some uh, uh, countries will get, will catch it very quickly for teaching. And on the other side, uh, learning how to use VR uh, will be a challenge because we need to also go further to learn what is important to uh, design not only learn the, of course, the basis, like the tools, like the uh, how to uh, how to uh, compute uh, and optimize your code. You have to code very early, and you have to be very good at that. But also, you need also the hardware. You need you need the sensors. You need uh, uh, to understand the space in 3D and. I think that uh, this is a challenge, how to transmit that to students. Thank you very much, Indira. And uh, Jeanne or Vincent, you want to, Vincent, you want to say something? Uh, yes, uh, I just want to add something because actually we can make VR everywhere with the technology. Um, I'm the proof of it. Actually, I'm on the bus to go to the station of uh, Laval in order to go back in Paris and I actually uh, make a conference with uh, every people here. And I think actually uh, the device is more and more quick uh, and easy to use. And I think we can ha actually make some courses with VR technology with smartphone uh, at home. And I think it's very interesting to also uh, help students to understand all the technology that we have all around the uh, yourself uh, all around uh, uh, your own home and try to uh, introduce uh, the base knowledge and the base key uh, concept of VR in order to help uh, them to understand how what is the tracking, what is the trouble of detection, what is the trouble of an uh, intuitive interaction and designing things at home with our own material, with our own uh, device it's a good thing in order to uh, enhance virtual reality and enhance teaching in virtual reality. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Jean, uh, uh, one last sentence uh, you want? 
Yeah, no, no game? No, 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 no I'm, I'm no? fine. It was okay. very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the people to, for being here. Thank you to Simon, Jean-François, Vincent, and for their participation. And now we can close this uh, panel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And uh, thank you all. See you next. Hello. Simon? Mm -hmm.